I went before this discussion I went and actually talked to a lot of people who worked for you or worked under you and I asked them what was Dan like what was his leadership style somebody actually I won't tell you who but somebody actually said oh Dan appo he's a tyrant and uh, and I I I think to myself if I was in a corporate culture and I was working for someone who was a tyrant I'd probably think you were a jerk and not want to work for you were you a tyrant Mr. Dan Gomez, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me. I really appreciate it. I know you said I can call you Dan, but I don't want to because uh, you know in our culture uh, we respect our elders. So I'm going to call you Mr. Dan Gomez if that's okay. Let's um let's get right into it if you don't mind. Uh, let's start right at the beginning. You were uh, you lost your dad when you were very young. Uh, and I'd like to just talk about that a bit. How old were you? Uh my father was a banker. and i was the only child uh, i lost him when i was about 12 plus i can't even imagine how difficult that must have been you know 12 years is so young you're still figuring out who you are uh, and then you lose your father how do you think that affected you uh my mother and father came from two different backgrounds uh, my father was a banker he was old royalist and uh, his love for sports and uh, he was a he was always at the temple as well majra ram here so we had a very uh, uh, bit of a religious background as well but i think uh, after his death uh, my mother had to take over the mantle of leadership she was a very determined woman and uh, we had enough wealth to sustain ourselves but uh, on a advisor role uh, she gave me lot lots of love but i don't think she was in a position to really advise advise me on my education or my career so a lot of things i had to do by myself and of course um, i had uh, close friends who were also very supporting during uh, my uh, school days and uh, so i i made a lot of calls myself i was a bit uh, radical i was a bit uh, i would say a bit of anti establishment guy even during my school days cutting school and ill disciplined having long hair i was not even allowed to sit for the final year next to the principal in the royal college boxing photograph so even even at that time you know i felt uh, i was against the, the system so but i think the early childhood of making lot of calls and making lot of mistakes made me subsequently much more disciplined focused guy when you talk about making mistakes uh, if you think about your entire career all of it what would you say is your biggest character flaw i think uh, volatility i was always very very volatile you know i would be willing to put on my gloves anytime uh, even even uh, during school days and to fight over my weight you know i i always had the kind of guts to do it because boxing was not my pet sport even in school i wanted to play cricket you know i uh, uh, played cricket at the under 12 under 14 level but then i realized uh, on meritocracy and all that uh, that i would prefer a sport because even at royal i felt there was uh, no meritocracy so even at that time i understood at that time i didn't really understand but i i when i took on boxing i realized that uh, you had to fight by yourself my coach was the first asian to captain cambridge university late danton obesekar he was an absolute gentleman he coached royal for 50 years and he would only say he doesn't care what your background is because most of the people in boxing came from bit underprivileged background uh, you know i come from a middle class background so uh, but for him it didn't matter your what your father's job how much of wealth that you had was immaterial he says put on the gloves son the best man will represent royal college so i like that style it gave me a lot of confidence uh, it gave me a lot of confidence to you know box for royal college so you leave school you get into accountancy into finance uh, you work for a few years but very early on you join mas and uh, early on in your ms career you go to pannala and i've heard you talking about pannala that it was a a life defining season for you i think you lived there for 10 15 years so what happened at pannala i think i went there as a young chief executive i would have been in my early 30s actually 
Mm-hmm. And uh, after about one and a half years at MAS Holdings, I had to switch from the finance directorship uh, to the mantle of leadership, be the chief executive. Now, because I was a good finance director, I thought I would be a good chief executive as well, which was not so, because the skills required being a good finance director and a good chief executive were like black and white. And it was a three-way joint venture uh, with Victoria Secrets, who were doing the front end of the business, MA Holdings at that time a very small company, I would say about a fifty million dollar company, and uh, you know one of the largest uh, manufacturers in the world, Sierra Leotards. So it was like married to three women living in the same house. Every decision that you know you would make uh, will piss off two people, two partners. How do you manage that? I was in my thirties. I had a young management team of young graduates. Who were just out from university, and I had ten British guys, including a matured manufacturing director. Now, so many balls in the air, and I've been driven. Now you have to turn around the plan. You know, it was a new setup for me to move to an urban background. My kids were very small, and uh, I I used to go on a, uh, to work on Monday, come back home on Wednesday. And go back again on Thursday and come back home on Friday. So three nights I was living in Panama, and I told my wife, "Dehara, look, I will do this for three years. I'll set it up, I'll get it going, and then I'll relocate myself to Colombo." But it never happened. The boy who went came as a matured man after 15 years, and it changed my life. Now, one of the first experiences I learned was I was driving the organization through the numbers <clears throat> because. That was my comfort zone, you know, looking at the PNL, looking at the balance sheets, looking at the market shares, etc. I missed the biggest trick in my life till one of the senior British guys who was our consultant setting up the project. He told me, "Dian, get the people equation right, and the numbers will automatically flow." Then I realized, you know, this is the way to go about it, and started building teams, building a culture, and. Uh, I basically didn't know anything about cultures. You know, the only culture I knew was the Royal College culture, and uh, it was not appropriate to be put into a Pandala culture because very little is background, and I learned a lot of mistakes. It's it's fascinating, and I and I really want to learn from you. You have this reputation of really knowing your people, not just knowing them like numbers on a spreadsheet, but knowing them, knowing them personally. So I I want to talk to you. About how you bring people around you and how you build a team, and maybe the best place to start is with your reputation. I went before this discussion. I went and actually talked to a lot of people who worked for you or worked under you, and I asked them what was Dian like, what was his leadership style, and many people would come and say, "Oh, Dian, he was very strong, almost militaristic in his leadership style." Somebody actually, I won't tell you who, but somebody actually said, "Oh, Dian, Apo, he's a tyrant." That's what they said. And and funnily, funny enough, I I don't think that person meant the word tyrant as an insult. I think they meant it as a compliment. This idea of strong, steely leadership, and uh, and I, I I think to myself, if I was in a corporate culture and I was working for someone who was a tyrant, I'd probably think you were a jerk and not want to work for you. But so I I I I don't know if tyrant is a fair characterization of of your leadership style. To be fair, but if I keep that on the side, I then think about. I watched some videos of your farewell from um, from MAS, and there were thousands of people. And I don't think it's a it's an exaggeration to say it was like a funeral. I mean, people were crying. Um, you can't fake that. It really, really looked like they were going to miss you. And so I'm I'm trying to reconcile these two pictures: one of the the tyrant, so to speak, and one of the leader who was a friend. Uh, which of these were you? Were you a tyrant? Or were you a friend, or were you both? How would you characterize your leadership style? I think uh, I was all what you said was absolutely true. Some people definitely will call me a tyrant or a dictator, but it was uh, I would sometimes correct them by saying a benevolent dictator. But uh, I think uh, I was a very socialist at heart. Somebody writes in uh, uh, one of my biographies. Uh, people think Dian was a communist. But he's a socialist at heart, uh, living a capitalist lifestyle, which I think is absolutely right. 
but when i come to think of it i was i needed perfection i can remember uh, you know a plant like slimline was kind of you know it was like walking into hilton hotel beautiful gardens landscape everything was perfect and we went on to win takimoto award few times perfect exacting and uh, one of my senior director says you know when he got down from the car and he sees three small beads and he says what's wrong with that and and shows him the bead and he says it was three beads you know and uh, you know but he says uh, it meant still that it should be zero beads. and i can remember when i was the chairman of hela coding subsequently uh, they wanted me to travel with their plants all over the place uh, the british guy with us owned partly by a british investment bank they wanted me to not to waste time by traveling here and there they wanted me to go by helicopter so every helicopter ride which takes about 35 minutes i land and then i do all that and go to the next plant so sometimes when i i look from the because it lands in sometimes the, the company grounds and uh, even even sometimes it land in uh, my you know Uh, MAS company grounds even mawata gang but i know the stress that people have to go through when i come in the helicopter or when i see the plant because from top i am looking at the grass and when i get down you know i pick my bag and then i get down from the helicopter i can see the grass being grass smell so that means the grass had been cut in the night and people used to tell me that we used to put search lights on and you know cut the grass because i'll be very finicky about that and uh, first thing i would go and is uh, check the toilets you know the the workers toilet should be good as the executive toilet otherwise they'll have a fancy toilet for the chief executive but you know the toilets of the workers will not be maintained so i was very demand and uh, being with my volatile and my swearing i don't think uh, if any of the other executives so ceo is sweared like what i used to swear uh they will immediately give the the resign resignation <laughs> or there will be something for on harassment but they would never do that they would always say maybe dan had a bad day at home or you know take the pun out of me by saying he's in a lousy mood because the wife would have beaten the guy up or something like that you know i used to kind of you know ignore all those you know snide comments but they knew that i would any time go to battle with them whether they were having a marriage problem or whether they were going through a divorce whether they want me to attest the marriage they want to for me to write the references uh, for me to give calls to the best universities in the world and recommend them i always did that i always went that extra 9 yards and i used to get the unvarnished truth about the organization and also built what i call because looking at my socialist uh, thinking uh, what i call the shay's cell system you know i should not be t- 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 teaching you that kind of tactics i could get to any of my plants you know straight into the unofficial union because of the cell system because they were the true leaders of the organization at the ground level uh, and uh, because they could they could operate they were the, the shadow men uh, management in like it because they couldn't do anything and uh, because i realized you know that was the real power base that i had in the organization so uh, through the cell system you know i could uh, because otherwise you know if you want to do something you know tough maybe uh, the senior management or some of the people would like to ex- execute all the bad stuff would always think what's in for me syndrome or you know will i will i be in the firing line or they be always nervous but at the ground level you know straight from the the top i could give the orders come on get this thing done so i could move any organization and for 26 years you know with the large crowd i didn't have a single showdown with the with my workers and somebody write somebody writes in my in a in an article recently says uh, dian's epitaph will be never written by the members of his board but by thousands of people who made made a difference in their lives which is absolute truth i made a difference in their lives you know whatever do do say for example i want the sierra lee 
global safety award, including Sri Lanka safety award. But when they gave me that hundred thousand dollars award to do a pediatric ward in Panadur Hospital, they asked, "How the hell do you do this?" I said, "I need to get the DNA of the organization to think it is that ten-year child which is working in the factory, and so that there is nothing, no harassment. Number two, they will not embark on any hazardous activity like you know cutting the plug and trying to put." you know the wires inside a socket you know and uh, anybody who didn't use the chain mill gloves sacked on the spot because i said your finger is important as my finger so things like that tough standards but they realized that i was all day always there for them let's talk about finding the best people hiring the best people i mean you must have hired hundreds if not thousands of people over the decades tell me about finding the best people what sets apart the best people you hire from the rest uh, let's start with um, a cv comes across your desk how important is what's on paper how important is that to you in my early years the cv was very important i used to always tell all the brilliant people you got the entry ticket to the game you got i mean you don't go to cambridge or harvard or any of the best universities or even to moroto university to engineering if you are a fool you know so you are technically competent in whatever you do i would never ask them any technical question i mean i never asked we had more than 250 seamas one time i never asked a single seama you know about a balance sheet or a, you know a pnl so what i would really ask you know looking at the cv i mean the organization would do the due process belvin test the the uh, you know myers briggs the numerical test all they can put through like a, for army training they would do that but those were basically material to me for me it was a gut feel and which became a problem as well because when there's succession planning you can't do succession planning on gut feel uh, crazy chief executive but it was so far uh, it worked at ma holdings and and hela as well so what i would really look at is the the soft skills part of it whether he's a team team player whether he's got the passion whether that's why the sporting thing came because people who are in sports understands uh, you know diffy understands the word resilience because there is the single guy who's kind of you know uh, played like tendulka or like michael jordan how many times have they failed in my life i failed more times than in my you know impressive cv so even in my exams because you know It, it doesn't. It doesn't work like that. So you find out the skill and the will of the man or the woman. You know, there was a young girl. She's in Canada today, and she was 23 from University of Nottingham, uh, Durga Shamugalingam. So I asked, "What would you like to do in 10 years?" You know, she's 23. She's looking at the my seat and said, "I'd like to sit in your seat." You know, I said, "That's great." I said, "Thank God. By the time you sit in my seat, I'll be retired." you know so she went to do an mba in states and she's in canada today so people like that the most interesting people the people who like to challenge you people like to give their opinion you know i had to change people because i want to recruit the best of best in class so to best in class you have to nurture them it's like building a plant you make them strong you make them battle experience they used to go with me all over the world even if i'm going with you know on boxing and fencing and all that they used to they used to go with me i used to drag them along and and buy their tickets you know you come along and see see the world do the networking you know build them that kind of a confidence and then they look into little detail in the tie you wear you know the shoes you wear you know so that you know when they sit and people used to cry when i used to go to paris on a business trip I said, you know, here's the money. I want to go to the loo. Now, do they go to the loo? No, they go to that, you know, market. Uh, I think uh, I can't remember the Masha something, Masha Birona something like that. They go there and they want to look for cheap stuff. You know, buy chocolates for the office. You know, one euro stuff. And they come back and say, you know, the, did you go to the loo? No, we went to the market. You can see how, you know, how I would react in four-letter words, swearing. 
There seem to have been a I lot of four letter words. Go. They go coming back. Yeah. But after years, they tell me, thank God. You know, I said, you go to Paris and you don't see the Eiffel Tower. You don't go to the Louvre. You know, it's like going to Sigiria and uh, seeing the Sigiria rock from 10 miles away and not going there and seeing the frescoes. So, I used to teach people like that. I was very demanding. But, you know, but later on they realized, okay, who the hell even our parents won't do this kind of stuff. And, you know, sometimes, you know, if you tell your daughter, they will say, no, we are not going there. We want to do our own shopping. You know, but I could tell my staff, no, you're going to see that. So, that's kind of a dictatorial tone. But it builds the culture because everything depends on the culture and how formidable is the culture to, you know, face an onslaught, uh, to face a COVID, face a tsunami or face a business crisis like in 2008. You know, your organization is, you know, can be maneuvered to adopt to any situation. And I got the, the best free hand from all my all my partners and my chairman, Mahesh Shamali. You know, sometimes you tell me I used to, uh, you know, grind my teeth and bite my tongue for the things that you do. But later on, I realized what the end game was. So, uh, I mean, it, it was a fantastic experience, you know, sharing experiences, great teams, great uh, young team. Uh, today, uh, you know, in my retirement, I can be very, very proud of all of them. I'm, I'm quite fascinated because I've, I've met Mr. Amalin and he comes across as a, a very gentle person and you self-admittedly are quite different, maybe even completely opposite, uh, but you both seem to work well together. We worked very well because uh, he was a great visionary. I, I think uh, I would rank him one of the best visionaries this country has produced. And for 26 years, uh, I sat next to him uh, on the right hand side. Uh, nobody even used to sit in that chair. And for a long, long time, I was his right-hand man as well. Uh, but we had a lot of difference of opinion because uh, he was very, very good in business and all that. I was very strong in my people's side I, and he knew that. And he allowed me to do the recruitment, etc. And, uh, and handle. And I think, uh, uh, I think one of the most demanding tasks for him, I don't think he will ever tell that, was managing Diane Gomez. You know, he says, even when Diane is not there, even if he gives me a call today and says, Diane, fix it. And uh, he knows that I will fix it. So, uh, you know, it was it was kind of a relationship. Uh, like if he's black, I would say I white. But he was a great chairman who understood and got the best of people like me. Do you think your timing when leaving MAS is right? Now, looking back at it now, uh, do you think the timing was right for you? I think I am the one who put the rule that everyone must retire at the age of 55. And in my contract itself, uh, when I joined, I would have been like 30. So uh, when I left, I had done only 27 years uh, at MAS. And uh, I did three more years. And uh, I said, I, actually, I was really going to retire. Till by sheer accident, this British company, Hella Clothing, a uh, chap called, young entrepreneur called Dominic uh, uh, McQueen, uh, got hold of me and said, you're young at 58 who retires. But I had, I had really done everything which was needed uh, for me to retire. And my art street, which I wanted to do, my boxing in the world body, uh, my villas, my daughters had, you know, just uh, finished their masters at Imperial. So they were all steady and finished their education. And uh, we were very comfortable. Uh, he convinced me. He said, look, no Sri Lankan apparel company has gone public. And, you know, you take a three-year stage, a three-year contract, which will make this company go public. And you start it and you take. And we were a 60 million company when I took over. And we acquired the foundation garments. And we made it a formidable company. Uh, I think this year they might go public. But after three years, uh, my health was taking a bit of a toll. And I was falling sick. Uh, I had already gone through a heart operation. And I realized uh, after my retirement that 
you know, it wouldn't, it wouldn't, uh, you know, do me good personally. If my health takes a toll, look, I don't want to be the richest man uh, in the cemetery. So I was very realistic and pragmatic. <coughs> so I, I retired, and uh, I didn't accept any job. I'm only on the board of Nestle and the Consul General for Georgia. <coughs> Sorry. So uh, at that time, looking back, uh, I wish that uh, it was a it was a uh, a better ending. But sometimes people felt I should have joined, taken the three-year assignment. Uh, maybe it was not the most appropriate thing. But <coughs> I didn't have any alternative, and it was a good, quite quite a good challenge. And I felt. You know, I could do a good run up to about 60, but I did up to 61, and that's it. So no more, no more full-time jobs. I do mentoring and, and all that. And uh, I created a good succession plan, and I was absolutely sure. I was 200% sure that my successors would do a better job uh, than than me, uh, and they have certainly done better. They've taken the company MS Holdings to a different level and I feel very, very proud that I taught them all the tricks. There are a few mistakes, but few regrets, but uh, you know, it, it has been, a, I think the timing was right because I always, and I told, I think Mahesh at that time when I left, I said, I want to retire like Kumar Sangatkar. And the, you know, at the top of the game. Time. Yeah. I had, my division was making $500 billion turnover. Now it's up to about $800 million. And uh, first time we did, my division made $50 million. So I said, you know, you must leave right at the top. Not when it's going down and people are tired and people say, hey, you need to get off now. Uh, and everybody's tired of you and tired of your style or your performance. So nobody could say that because I left, uh, you know, the organization at the peak of my performance. The uh, leadership of MAS set out to build a world-class organization. And at the time you joined, yes, they were a good company, but they weren't the behemoth they are, and they are now, and they probably weren't world-class. I think about uh, Sri Lankan boxing. At the time, Russia had, if I got the numbers correct, Russia had 30,000 boxing gyms, nearly a million boxers. India, China, similar numbers. And in Sri Lanka, little old Sri Lanka, we had 500 boxers, nothing compared to them. And you had this idea to take a Sri Lankan boxer and put them in the Olympics. It was a, without being disrespectful to you, it was a crazy idea. Uh, the people around you, if they were being honest with you, probably should have told you you were mad. The numbers don't work. They just don't work. Uh, it, you yourself said it, it was an impossible dream. And I've heard people talk about vision. I've heard leaders talk a big game, but there's a, there's a big difference between talking a big game about vision and actually executing vision, and even more than that, getting people to rally around and own an impossible vision. And here we are, we've had a boxer in the Olympics, we've got boxers who won Commonwealth medals after you've taken over. Uh, the impossible dream has come true. And so my question is, it's one thing to talk a big game about vision, but how do you get people to believe an impossible vision and how do you get people to buy into it? How do you get your team to buy into it so that you, that, so that you can achieve it? I think uh, <clears throat> at that time it was a crazy dream because I myself didn't know what it takes uh, to take a Sri Lankan boxer for the Olympic Games. At that time when I shook hands with uh, General Jagajaya Surya, <clears throat> who was the chef division in 2009, uh, uh, 2000, no sorry, uh, 1999 for the SAF Games where I went <clears throat> and the chairman of the National Olympic Committee when they said look, why don't you start boxing at Slimline? And within eight years, you can take a boxer for the Olympic Games. I didn't know what it takes to get a man there. Only 28 people will box at the Olympic Games. First eight will get selected at the World Championships, where 130 odd countries will take part. All 200 countries take part in boxing for the, those 28 places at the Olympics. Next eight places, sorry, next four places, will be given to the Asian co continent, which will have 60 people, 60 countries fighting for that way. So we had no dog's chance. I didn't know that. 
I first picked the team from underprivileged backgrounds. I offered them a future to take them to the education, uh, teach them English, teach them computer science for people like Anurudh Ratnayaka, Anusha Koditwaku, Harsha Kumara, etc. Then I went and got, we realized that we were fighting. Uh, it's like <clears throat> trying to race in a Formula One race with a Morris Pine. No chance. You know, where did the best coaching come from? Cuba. So I managed to <clears throat> talk to the Cuban ambassador and get it all fixed. You know, get a good development coach. The technology was put in. I had the resources to do it. Zero government support. We embarked on the journey. For three years, we saw misery. You know, I used to travel myself with the team, be in the corner man, keep it going. And people used to think it's impossible dream. But then I started creating heroes. You know, you need heroes, you know, to make this world think. Can I be a Kumar Sangakkara? Can I be Anuruddha Ratnayaka? Can I be a Dabayanti Darsha? And uh, most of the athletes were also employed by us, by uh, the organization. So I started getting people involved, you know, to believe in the dream. So you can have a great vision, but you need to execute it. <clears throat> the boxers used to go run 10 kilometers from Pandala to Kuliapitiya and back at 5 o'clock in the morning with the Cuban coach going in the cycle. 200 push-ups a time, 600 push-ups are a day. Other than Saturday, Sunday, it was a boot camp, practice, practice and practice. And I risked my corporate career in a lot of issues at home and my daughters, you know, taking all my holidays, going with the team and coming back. And I traveled the whole world, you know, from cold countries like Uzbekistan, minus 40, uh, to fight in Morocco, you know, Tunisia, all these places. And it was not a pleasant uh, environment in some of those places. Tough environment. And with three boys, we took on the world. And eight years, when Ratnayaka finished at the World Championships, ranked number five, getting up to the quarterfinals and to the Olympics, I knew I had cracked the dream that Sri Lankans are world class. If we are world class making the best panty and the bra in the world, to hand rows of the world, to Victoria's Secrets of the world, I've realized, you know, that the right environment, right ingredients, that we are world class. Unfortunately, you know, it's a politics which ruins sports or anything else. You can have great visions, the execution part of it. Picking the right people on the job. And that's virtually impossible in an Asian country like ours. I'm, I'm assuming things in the corporate world are a lot more professional. But what was your insight into working with the bureaucracy? The bureaucracy of the state, uh, the boxing board. What did you learn? How did you navigate those relationships? What was your experience? They always consider me a bit of a radical guy. Uh, in the private sector itself, you know, a lot of corporates would consider me very radical, unorthodox. But it was successful. Nobody can deny because people used to ask, are you all in sports or are you all making lunch? I said, what is your profit uh, bottom line and what is this is my bottom line? So nobody could, nobody could kind of dispute, you know, it didn't add up to the bottom line. It didn't add up to uh, zero industrial stoppages. Uh, people could, you know, give their life to win any award. You know, you create cultures like that. You know, people can't deny it's grudging respect that they would have. And so are sports, you know, because I challenge uh, the sporting associations, being the vice president at the National Olympic Committee and then some of the other uh, sporting staff. I challenge the, the what you call the administration on uh, integrity, uh, on fair play, etc. So you think, you know, I didn't want to be the most popular person here. I want to be respected as somebody who can who can deliver on the promises so what i promised to my country that i delivered nevertheless i see the bureaucracy the public service people are very very bright you know they don't have the you know dog and pony show but they're bright people who are trying to do a good job of work but unfortunately uh, i feel that most of them their hands and legs are tied they operate within those parameters they don't challenge the boss 
you know they don't uh, it's a really top down culture you know within those bureaucratic rules that uh, you know people tend to operate you know which we have to a certain extent a certain freedom uh, in the private sector because if private sector delivers and within those parameters you know uh, you can take a risk and you have to be accountable but in the public sector you can't do things like that you know if you do things like that you know there'll be you know commissions and fcids and all kinds of things which will come so do people want to do it no so that's the, so you need to have a happy balance where the country recognizes people on meritocracy uh, people are picked not on their political affiliations but on meritocracy if the right man for the right job will make this country so productive and i think uh, you know certain of the of the people that i deal with want to do it but their their hands and legs are tied as well because the system does not allow that you know so you are you are fighting a system uh, you know uh, which is uh, which is sometimes i would say corrupt sometimes i would say uh, looking at a four year term it's not long term you so always very- worried about whether you can keep your job in the long term whether you yes. get re-elected or whatever so getting that vision into execution um, is a got good ceo's job otherwise it's all talk and you know zero execution means nothing and i used to work for a you know serally ceo and it always uh, you know he always says you know better to have wild horses than push dead monkeys you know so i'd rather prefer with you know wild horses rather than try to push dead monkeys because you'll never get the chance i'd uh, just like to ask you about your life right now uh, you're very driven and in this season um, you know people like you hard work and going towards a goal motivates you so in this season what does success look like what is inspiring you what is motivating you what is next for you i think i really want to enjoy life i'm i'm in the world body of boxing and the asian body of boxing which i make i can make some good contribution to world of boxing both in sri lanka and and across the globe and they appreciate my capacity so i love that it is something i drive and passionate about uh, the meeting people and going all over the world and meeting new people and creating those environments and pockets of uh, excellent centers for the future of boxing which i you know is is my passion the second thing is i always wanted to create an art street down stratford avenue uh, for my retirement which i've done and uh, i hope you know my legacy will will be there to you know create a nice uh, environment for people to come and have coffee and food and and enjoy ah but more than that in the last i would say uh, in the year i have been mentoring a lot of people uh, teaching people at the university level and at least once a week uh, talk to people you know mostly by zoom uh, and even next week i got two lectures for the institute of chartered accountants and at the university for the management faculty so i teach i want to make a difference and uh, i would uh, it's not about teaching them uh, education or technical skills because i think they are more up to date much more savvy it's about how to position yourself how to face an interview how to build a repertoire of skills and uh, how to develop your emotional intelligence because if you take a physics graduate he knows only about physics if you take a mathematics graduate a sri lankan guy and uh, he knows only about mathematics you know you know the best mathematics brains can be the best chess player this can can produce so things like that because i see a uh, difference in our education system uh, and 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 when they go abroad their skill they have to fend for themselves they have to kind of do internships and uh, and uh, you know do things like that which kind of gives them that holistic approach so i am trying to make the 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 playground and uh, 
you know, even so that a kid from Pandala Mahavidyale can compete with somebody from CIS or Royal College or St. Thomas's, you know, teach things like that, you know, how to give them the skill base, etc. So I enjoy that. So there are a lot of people who come for advice and all that, my ex-employees and some of my friends, all that. Mr. Dan Gomez, fascinating insights. Thank you so much for your time. It, this conversation has really benefited me and I'm sure it will be very useful for many other young leaders who watch it. So thank you, thank you very much. Thank you very much.